Julie, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone at Catalyst who uh, I'm honored to be here today. And um, I was actually just telling you, Lorraine, a little bit um, earlier that I've always been interested and aware of just how uneven the playing field is between men and women in the workplace. But nothing more than having a baby and being a mother really highlighted that for me. It made it so much more personal. Um, <clears throat> my son is six months old, and like many mothers, I'm sure, in this room, I am. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I would say I was, I'm struggling a little bit to balance having a very stressful job, being an anchor, and also being a mother at the same time. I was telling you that, um, you know, I've had to, um, there have been times when, you know, I've been pumping at work, and I'll get a call saying, there's breaking news, there's been a car bomb in Northern Ireland or wherever, we need you to go to set right now. And literally with milk stains on my shirt, I have to run to the studio. And I'm telling the director, please zoom in so the audience cannot see the milk stains on my shirt. So, so obviously there does need to be change. I don't have all the answers, but that is why you're here. So, <laughs> um, so you have been the leader of Catalyst for about six months now. Congratulations on the new gig. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Prior to Catalyst, you worked at a lot of male-dominated companies. What was it that inspired you? Having worked at so many companies that are dominated by men, what was it that inspired you to dedicate your career to helping the advancement of women? Well, Zane, I love the story that you started with because my career also has been one of a balancing act between family and work and doing that successfully. And I entered the workplace in 1977 working for IBM uh, and you know, the world was quite a bit of a different place at that time. Um, I was on the heels of the women's movement and we were very much wanting to be, um, you know, to, to prove that women could be successful. And IBM was a wonderful place to work for even in those days. They had very progressive policies about women um, in the workplace. We had great role models and they really valued us. And, but the workplace was really a different place. So I, having a um, career in family, uh, I did an eight week maternity leave with my first child and six weeks with, with the, the second child. Um, so I I've felt like um, I really had a commitment to uh, pay it forward. Um, and I've done that throughout my career. I've been on the boards of the Watermark, which was the leading women's organization in Silicon Valley um, when I was an entrepreneur and an executive there. Uh, when I was at the State Department, I uh, created uh, programs for women in entrepreneurship around the world. And then most recently, I was involved with uh, women in STEM. So I, I really felt that, especially coming into the <laughs> that I did that this was something that it's almost I, as if everything that you've done with your life has really prepared you really you for know this, what for this it, job. that's really true and when I was interviewing for the job uh, one of the board members Jackie Hinman said to me I bet you feel like you've been preparing for this all of your life and you know that's exactly how I feel I feel like so much of what I've done is really um, prepared me for this job and this is such a wonderful platform at a such important time to really pay it forward um, this particular conference is about the future at work. Um, how can any leader like yourself transform a culture to make it more inclusive, do you think? Well, in, in terms of the future at work in general, um, we are going to spend a lot of time at this conference talking about the trends in the future of work, uh, technology, globalization, migration paths. Uh, all of this says that we have to have more in, um, inclusive environment because it's going to be more diverse, talent shortages are going to be there, and we've got to f understand how to work together. So Catalyst has really to get dedicated our work over the last 56 years to understanding what it means to be able to make workplaces that work for women and work for everyone, to have really inclusive environments. So 
We have a lot of um, vehicles for doing that. I think our four award winners mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. really are great examples. There's a lot we can learn from each other about what it takes to build an inclusive environment. What Schneider Electric just talked about, I think is really inspiring, how they've really looked at what are all the needs that women have so that they can really create an environment that allows them to be successful. And as I think about it, in, in the 1970s when I went in, I, you know, just the suits that we had to wear. When I went on maternity, when I was pregnant, I had to order a, a maternity business suit with a bow tie out of a catalog oh so goodness. that I would have the right uh, outfit for IBM oh in, the, in, in the 80s. Okay. So things have changed a lot, and we have a lot more flexibility, and I think that's wonderful. So things have changed a lot, but there still needs to be, there's still more work that needs to be there's done. There's definitely still um, work to be done. Every single woman, I shouldn't say every, but I imagine, I can't speak for everybody in this room, but I imagine that a lot of women in this room have experienced some kind of bias, especially minority women as well, some kind of bias in the workplace. Have you ever experienced bias? Um, talk to us about that. And also what you think leaders should be doing to address bias in the workplace. Well, I think everyone experiences bias. Um, there's bias on gender, race, and ethnicity. Um, I think that we need to increase awareness of that bias for everyone and then give very concrete ways that um, it can be addressed in the workplace. So we recently launched the um, um, uh, a campaign, um, by, uh, hashtag bias correct. I don't know how many of you have seen that campaign. <laughs> Yay! We're really excited about that campaign, in fact. Uh, we're in uh, bus shelters all around the city, so if you're in town, you might see them. Um, <laughs> they're really fun. And uh, we did that with the Burns Group. Um, it's very, um, very innovative, and it really is focused on how do we make people aware of bias. In, in that campaign, we took a number of words, and uh, in my mind is uh, aggressive versus assertive, um, and we have a, a Escalera company that we partner with actually has a sort of a bias corrector that you can put in your chat groups. And that's really raising mm. awareness. These people don't oftentimes realize that they're being biased, do they? Well, they don't, but I think we can make them aware of it. And then a lot of companies are doing uh, unconscious bias training. Mm -hmm. um, but even more than that, we've got to build cultures that enable people to interrupt bias to, to, in the moment. So, and, and that's what Catalyst is trying to do. Um, we've heard a lot in the news about the Me Too movement, and with the Me Too movement um, comes this sort of belief that there are a lot of men in the workplace who are getting it wrong in terms of how they address that issue. Can you give any examples of how male leaders in the workplace are actually getting it right when it comes to dealing with Me Too? Well, you know, the Me Too movement um, in some ways has been a really important for the work at Catalyst because it really highlights that we still have systemic issues in the workplace that we need to be addressed. Um, but the reality is, despite what the media may have us believe, <laughs> wow, <laughs> that you know, most, <laughs> that you know, most men really want to help. They really want to be able to be part of the solution, but they just don't know how to participate. So, you know, we are providing training. Um, in fact, we have a very successful program called Men Advocating Real Change, or MARC, which helps men understand the issues that still exist in the workplace, um, unconscious bias, stereotypes that exist, um, allows them to feel comfortable, to, to build empathy around the, these situations and gives them experience on how they can actually um, interrupt these biases and support women, be mentors and sponsors for women, and really participate in, in that. And I, I think this gives them the tools that they need to be effective. Um, one other issue that uh, every single workplace is dealing with, as we just saw addressed with our earlier panel, is um, the gender pay gap. I'm from the UK, and the British government mandated that every single company that has 250 or more employees has to post online how much they pay men on average versus women. And it was quite embarrassing for a lot of companies because you have all these companies in the UK that their CEOs go out and they speak in public 
when the lights are on and the cameras are flashing about the importance of diversity and equality. Meantime, in their own company, you're seeing massive pay gaps between men and women. And the BBC, the way they handled it was somewhat controversial. The pay gap between men and women in the BBC was so vast that they decided to address it by trying to pay the men less. Which everybody was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, so, um, so what, would you say, what would you say should be done to eradicate the pay gap between men and women in the United States? Uh, I, I very much appreciate you mentioning this issue because it's an issue that I feel very passionate about um, and I think something the Catalyst has um, a position on. You know, I actually yesterday uh, the Australian gender agency that deals with pay gap visited me and I was in the UK about a month ago where that was the top issue and I was in Canada where in Can so in Australia they for five years had a requirement to mm -hmm. um, publish um, gender pay gap issues and they have a lot of experience with it and in the UK uh, the data is there's a gross measure when you compare pay um, the, the pay gap is affected by both whether you're paying the same for equal performance, mm -hmm. um, for equal work, but also it's affected by the pyramid. How many people do you have at different levels in the organization? Mm -hmm. So it's the combination of those two that are affecting things. So even if you get equal gender pay, you, you still have this issue. Um, and in Canada, they're struggling with exactly how are they going to implement this. So um, I, I think that it's an important measure for on both of those accounts. Um, and that companies need to start to get prepared in the United States as well for for under, for these uh, for addressing this. Now there are companies who've done a very good job. For example, Salesforce went through and looked at equity across their whole organization, and they increased the women's pay. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, so uh, companies need to be proactive to get ahead of this. It's also interesting because I sometimes think that um, the issue is so difficult because I have uh, a co-worker at CNN who had just confided in me that you know she'd been she's probably one of the best producers at her job and she confided in me that she never had the courage in 10 years to ever ask for a raise and I've always wondered when you have a situation where somebody doesn't have either the belief in themselves or the confidence to go up and ask for a raise and they're a woman and as a result there's a massive pay gap at a company um, between both genders, is that then the company's fault? Because the company could easily argue, well, she didn't come and ask for a raise, so how is that our fault? Um, and so, as a woman myself, I've also really worked hard to make sure that I understand my value and I can communicate that value as well to others. I also think that's part of the journey we as women have to go through as well. Well, you know, we have laws that say there should be equal pay. Right. Um, and companies who are going to attract and retain the best women need to make sure that they implement those practices. Right. So um, how do we show that technology doesn't bake in biases? Because, you know, it's not just about my industry or your industry. It's also in STEM roles. We need to advance women in the STEM roles as well. How do we ensure that technology doesn't bake in the biases? You know, I, I've spent most of my life in Silicon Valley in the tech industry, and um, I, I see opportunity and risk with technology as there always is. So on the positive side, we can use technology for good. Um, for example, the, the, um, the plug-in that, that, uh, that Escalera did that interrupts bias in chat and gives you an alternative word is a great way of showing um, using technology for that benefit. Um, alternatively, um, you, there's, there's examples of where um, technology increases the bias. Um, in fact, in the um, clinical trials, classically, um, they were only using men to do clinical trials. So then they had to bring women in so that you, have a, a, you get rid of the bias. So as we start to think about technology being cl more closely aligned through AI and robots in the workplace, we really have to have teams that are thinking about um, diversity, and in diversity and inclusion is going to be even more important to make sure we don't build in these biases. And how important is, I mean, just talk to us about the difference between a sponsor and a mentor. How important is, is it to have um, somebody that sponsors you or mentors you at any given company? And also, 
you yourself paying it forward? Have you had a female role model that has helped you get where you are today? Um, that's a great uh, question. So a sponsor is someone who's in a place to actually help you move ahead in your career. A mentor is someone who can help you with the discussions and advise you. So both mentors and sponsors can be very important to you, but a sponsor is someone who can really make that difference. Now, I've had some really great sponsors, and uh, when I was at IBM, um, when I was pregnant with my second child, I was um, working um, for the head of sales, um, and um, he promoted me while I was out on maternity leave. He put me as the branch manager in the office that was right near where I worked, and he actually moved the other branch manager up to San Francisco and held the job open to me so that I could have that job. Now, that's really true sponsorship, yeah. and I really appreciate that. And, you know, of course, I try to do that um, I, with many people that I've known in my career as well. Because right, it's very important to pay it forward and, um, and women sort of taking care of other women in the workplace and, and making sure that you foster relationships and nurture them too. Um, so how can male-dominated organizations and industries better? I mean, you've worked in so many male-dominated industries. How can they... Um, better help women advance in the workplace, do you think? Well, I'd like to give an example of um, our dinner sponsor, Chevron, um, and Mike Worth, who's the CEO. So Mike was the head of all the ERGs on his way up to the top, and he, he decided that well, we really need to get men more involved in the conversation if we want to have more women. And of course, he understood that in an engineering-oriented organization, there needs to be even more proactive involvement to make sure that women both come into the organization but are retained in the organization. So he adopted our MARC, or Men Advocating Real Change program. He actually adopted it to Chevron and created something called MARC Teams, which are like leaning groups for men, and now some women are in them as well, where they really can talk and dialogue about these issues, and he advocated that. Um, and um, Chevron, in addition, um, had really brought a lot of the learnings back to us and has given us our largest grant ever of $5 million to... Oh, wow. to <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes. To, scale, ...to scale these programs um, across the world. Um, and final question before we open up to the audience. What would you say... What, was your, what is your future vision for the workplace and how should Catalyst help achieve that? Well, I, I think we have an extraordinary moment in time right now. First of all, the focus on this issue is greater than it's been in any time since I entered the workplace in the 70s on the heels of the women's movement. But more importantly than that, we have some really major changes happening in the workplace. That's why this conference is all about the future at work. We have a major generational change that's changing the nature of the workforce and changing the values. But we also have um, changes in technology and migration patterns on, uh, uh, on globalization. So I think we have an opportunity together to really work on um, a future that is more equitable, more inclusive, um, and really fulfilling for everyone, not just for women. So I think together Catalyst is, um, has this opportunity to convene so many great companies that are thinking about the future of work and to make sure we create the future of work that really does accomplish that. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, does anybody have any questions for Lorraine? I'm trying to see without my glasses if anyone is raising their hand. No, okay. Do I, do I see anyone? So um, just talk to us a bit more about leadership because having to, when you're in a company, um, getting the leaders to change their mindset about promoting and advancing women, how do you go about doing that? Well, I, I think leadership needs to start at the top um, and making culture change is not easy, um, but having a vision for where you want to be, and then putting the processes and measurements in place 
that allow people to understand what they need to do and, 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 and reinforcing that. I thought the example of Schneider Electronics that we just mm -hmm. heard, and I'm sure from our other award winners will hear, was a great example of how they looked at all the issues. They started at the top, they, but also got great ideas from the bottom as well. They did both. They empowered people to make change, and they also explained to people how, how you know, leadership the leadership um, empowered people to do that. And then they put the mechanisms and processes and checks and balances in place um, to enable that. Because it's still, though, quite difficult to change a culture, though. Sometimes when it's already cemented and in place, it's difficult to change a culture. Well, you know, I, I will say that every leader has to make cultural changes over time because organizations change mm -hmm. and the world changes. So if you don't make these changes, you're not going to be competitive. Even in Catalyst, you know, coming into Catalyst, um, Catalyst has been around for 57 years almost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm making changes as a new leader. I'm looking at how we can be more innovative, how we can, um, uh, how we can expand our um, products that um, provide more tools for our supporters. If you look at when Catalyst began, it was more about awareness. Um, now it's more about the how. Mm -hmm. So these are things you, we need to do to change culturally. We also need to change, bring new employees in who bring new skill sets as well. Okay. Uh, let's see again. If, oh, there is a question. Do I see somebody raising? Yes, I have a question. Okay. I, I'm wondering if at Catalyst you're seeing any trends in terms of a backlash following the Me Too movement uh, with respect to men who perhaps are reticent to form relationships with women in the workplace to support them? And uh, if so, whether you have thoughts about any particular strategies to address that backlash? So, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, sure, that's a very good question. Uh, of course, one that is on a lot of people's minds. Um, the we need to give men the tools to be able to address these issues appropriately. And it needs to start at the top, where the top leadership sets um, a no tolerance policy for issues on sexual harassment, gives good vehicles for people to, um, talk, uh, to, um, make, uh, to um, report, and then it gets investigated and handled well. But we also need to give the tools to, tools to men to create um, an inclusive environment. And that's when I talked about the MARC training, the Men Act, Ad Advocating Real Change, is a great vehicle for, to help men have the positive reaction and be able to handle this. Yeah, that is a great question because there's been so much confusion about you know, how, to, how men and women can form even platonic relationships in the workplace without men feeling concerned or worried about what might happen? Well, there needs to be a no tolerance also for um, for not. It is not okay to not have meetings with women. It's not okay to you know to not have lunch. That that is. We are not changing that. The pendulum that is, can't swing so far in the other right. direction. Right. Um, okay. Any other questions? Yes. The table. Yes. Yes. I think a microphone is coming to you. I believe. Okay, I'll just go ahead. Good morning. Hi, Sophia Khan with Medtronic. I wanted to ask really quickly, you mentioned, Lorraine, that you have to interrupt bias, and I was just wondering if you had an example of that. Um, a specific example, of, well, I think in meetings is a great opportunity to interrupt bias that you know, often, I mean, the classic is that women get talked over a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and if you know how to stop that, be aware of it, and then bring the conversation so everyone's in the conversation, mm -hmm. that's a, a, an easy example that I think almost everyone in this room has observed on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Talked over, not getting taken seriously. Right. You might have an idea, and a man has the same idea, and his idea is, suddenly better than yours, right, <laughs> even exactly. though it's the same idea, but exactly. whatever. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Oh, yes, you have a question. Great. Hi. Um, I think uh, 
we can probably all agree in this room that words matter. And I've been in the space for a really long time, and you know, there are a lot of different terms. And you know, there's gender equity, there's gender equality, and women's empowerment. Like, how do you define those? And for an organization, what do you think it's important for them to focus on? Yeah. What do you think? What do you think is important for organizations to just to focus on equity, equality, or empowerment? Equity, equality, or empowerment. She was just saying that words matter, and in terms of what you think organizations should focus on, should it be more on equity, equality, or empowerment? Well, I, you know, that frame I think is a valuable framework. I, I think that we uh, we think of the most one of the most important things is to build an inclusive environment that allows everyone to bring their self to work, their whole self to work and really feels that they are belonging in the organization. And that's what we really think about inclusiveness. So um, people should, we should create an environment where people can really reach their full potential. And that's what we're focused on. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, I see, okay, yes. Hi, there was a very interesting um, Harvard Business Review article late last year, specific to boards, but I think it can be taken to other levels of management too within companies that as, the, as companies expand the definition of diversity, uh, women and people of color actually lose out. So I'm wondering if you can offer your thoughts on that. Is that a trend that you're seeing that companies may be beginning to expand their definition of diversity? Uh, a, apart from, from what we kind of traditionally think of and how that's impacting uh, women and people of color within the workplace. So, okay, so go ahead. Okay, no, so, so you're basically saying that um, the definition of what diversity is is changing and it goes beyond women and people of color and whether or not women and minorities end up losing out as a result. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, you know, the definition of diversity varies in every country around the world. And that's why I think when we listen to Schneider Electric, when we're going to hear from Deutsche Post DHL Group, who's in 200 plus countries around the world, you realize that the issues are very different regionally. But gender is universal. And that's why I believe the UN Sustainable Development Goals, goal, goal number five, has to do with gender equity. You know, if we can make it work for women, we can make it work for everyone. And these policies and programs we put in place um, are going to vary. Um, I, the, um, the migration uh, uh, pla uh, you know, trends, the globalization, means that we have to figure out how to have an inclusive culture um, with in, in diverse uh, places all around the world. And Catalyst is going to expand our research on the intersection of gender, race, and ethnicity globally so that we can provide actionable capabilities for dealing in this very, very diverse world. I mean, that's something that we've, I think that's a great question actually, because that's something that we talk about on CNN a lot that diversity isn't just gender and race, it's diversity of opinion. Obviously, CNN gets accused of. <laughs> being liberal and biased, and so it's important to us to have more conservative voices on the air and that sort of thing. But yes, she's right. The definition of what diversity is, is a very fluid definition, and it's changing all the time. It's not just about race and gender anymore. And so that, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, any other questions? There's somebody over there, I think. Hi, I was just wondering what you meant when you said you have to give men tools so they can understand diversity and gender. I mean, <laughs> you know, being respectful, being polite, not talking over, I mean, these things are just not that difficult to <laughs> understand. So what are we supposed to teach them to do? You know, I've always said that everything you need to learn in life you learned in kindergarten. But, but the fact is that we, you know, the golden rule, all these basic things are absolutely at the essential. I mean, these, but we need to make sure that we practice them on a day-to-day -day basis. But so I, I, I do think that enabling these conversations, enabling discussions, becoming aware of these unconscious biases are things we have to practice at home and at work on a daily basis. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, final question. Okay. There's a lady in red.
Uh oh. I can answer. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Um, controversial question. We have an administration here in the United States that doesn't support a lot of what, most of what you have just said and have done things to counter that. And I think companies can do this, and that's great, and everybody's doing a great job, but when you have certain laws and practices and things put in place to stop it, we need to also work with elected officials and get the right people in office to help us all do this. So that's something I think it is something that we need to consider all the time. So anyone who's sitting here from the United States, just keep that in mind. Do you want to, I want yeah. to get that. Yeah. I do, I do, I think that's a, a, a very well, controversial but um, uh, important point is that we are in an, an increasing fractured world um, where there's distrust in a lot of institutions. Um, Edelman's recent trust index said that people trust their employers more than a lot of other institutions. I think um, CEOs and senior leaders like all of you um, are in a place where you can really role model and show what the world really needs to be like. You are, <laughs> you know, if you think about this audience and the number of people that you touch around the world, in your organization, in, through your supply chain, through the communities that you impact, you have the opportunity to really show the world the way it, it really should be. I mean, what we heard about Schneider Electric and what they're doing, not only internally in their organization, but in their communities is really amazing. And so I just challenge all of us to be those role models, even in a world that is increasingly fractured. And also, isn't it a great thing, just to address your, your point, isn't it a great thing that Every time the pendulum swings one way, it always swings back the other way. And we have seen the most diverse group of candidates running for office. How many, I mean, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, so many minorities, so Amy Klobuchar, so many women running for office. And it happened again in the midterms as well. I think that is such a beautiful thing that even though the pendulum swings one way, it always swings back the other way. So I'm happy about that. Um, and then lastly to you, if you could name one skill one skill that a leader should have in order to make the workplace much more inclusive and successful, what would you say it was? Commitment. 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 Good answer. Commitment. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you again, Lorraine and Zane. Let's give them another round of applause for that powerful conversation. So I'm happy to introduce our next winner spotlight, and that's Bank of America. And I'm happy to also welcome Cynthia Bowman, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer to the Bank of America team, uh, to the stage to share their remarks. And while she comes up here, let's watch the video for Investing in Women. Please roll the video. What would you like the power to do? Listening to how people answer that question helps us understand what is most important in their lives. It's how we deliver on a purpose to help make financial lives better through the power of every connection. 